Somebody say faithful. I think we can do better than that. Somebody say faithful. He is faithful in your life. Say he is faithful. He is faithful. How's everybody feeling today? I like this side right here, man. This is my favorite side. I don't like you guys. I just like this side. How are we feeling right here? There we go. I don't like you guys no more. How about this side over here? How are we feeling over here? There we go. I take that back. I love all of you. We feeling good? Hey, let's have fun in church. Let's have fun in church. Uh, you made it out here. We're able to be with one another. A lot of us don't get to see each other all the time. For some of us, once a week. For some of us, if we're honest, maybe once every other week. For some of you, maybe once a month. Uh, but guess what? We're going to talk about that today. Can I, can I just put a warning out there? There is a good chance today that you may be upset with me at the end of this message. Um, there is a good chance today that you may feel personally attacked. I must be honest. Uh, that's just the reality. Um, there's a good chance today that you may feel that I am putting your business out there. I am talking about you directly. Um, just know that I'm not. Has nothing to do with you. But we know what it has a lot to do with. An enemy who is pursuing you. And a conviction of mine here. And in, in, I love my small group that I am in. Where's my small group at? Make some noise. There we go. So um, the, my small group this past week, um, it wasn't, we weren't talking about Jesus returning in the rapture, but it came up. And how many of us have been in church for a while? Anybody here? Okay, we've been in church for a while, especially a lot of us who grew up in a more Pentecostal uh, type of setting or even like Baptist, all that. We've been hearing of this second coming of Christ, right? And I was telling the team this morning, I remember growing up thinking to myself, like as a kid, all they would preach is that Jesus is coming back and get your heart ready. And I remember thinking, I'm never going to have kids. I'm never going to get married because Jesus is going to come back. And, and not, to, not to dilute that, right? Because it, just because it hasn't happened yet, somebody say it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And so today, is, is God was starting to really deal with me and saying, hey, what should I really speak on as we, we continue this series, Altars? And, and really, this series is kind of having a play on words, right? Because not just are we talking about the altar, which is a sacred place, but we're looking at how the altar is sometimes altered for our convenience, how the altar is sometimes altered based on what fits our lives. So when Pastor opened up the message last week or the series, he really kind of laid the foundation on what an altar is and what the purpose of the altar is. So today, as I was kind of looking at this and said, okay, God, if, if we're looking at altars and, and the alterations that we make, what are some of the things that we do? So today I want to preach a message titled, The Altar of Convenience. The Altar of Convenience. Who here likes convenience? Be honest. How many of us here like convenience? Yes, that's okay. That's why convenience stores make so much money, right? Um, that's why these quick, these uh, get rich quick programs are so successful. We like convenience. But today as I'm up here, and, and if you find anything that I'm saying as a personal attack, please know that it is not. But please take it as God is really trying to do something. Because today I come to preach as if Jesus is coming back right now. I'm preaching as if your soul is on the line because it is. Because I want you to walk out of here feeling good, but I want you to also know that at the end of the day, there is a heaven and a hell. And it's not just about you feeling good when you leave here. There is a reality that depending on how you live your life and what you do determines where you will end up in eternity. Do you understand that? Yes. Can I preach to you that way? Yes. I don't want to sugarcoat things today. And today I may be not be talking about everything that may be considered sinful, but I will be talking about things in your life that may show signs of where you're headed. Or that may be positioning us in positions where the enemy sees you as an easy target. So can we get into it today? Do me a favor, stand to your feet. And turn your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 9 verse 23. I want us to read a portion of scripture as we really kind of set the foundation for this message today. If you're watching online, as we said earlier, we welcome you and we pray that God will also touch your heart today. Listen, if you're watching this today, don't get offended because today not only am I speaking to the people in the room, but you better bet I am speaking to you and there is going to be a point where I will call you out directly. So stay engaged. Do me a favor. Share this. 
because I believe that God is going to touch some hearts today. Luke chapter 9, do we got it? How many of us know that in order for us to live a life for Christ, we need to sacrifice? Everybody say sacrifice. Sacrifice. We use that word a lot in church, don't we? Right? Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. But let's really look at what the word sacrifice means. Sacrifice is giving up something valuable for the sake of something else regarded as more important. What you need to understand, church, is that in order for you to live for Christ, it requires sacrifice. But not sacrifices that you just pick and choose. Not what's convenient for you. It requires sacrifices in areas that may feel inconvenient. That may feel like you don't want to do that, that you don't want to give this up. That's what a sacrifice is. Everything else, when it's done with the wrong heart, is just done in vain. So let's read here in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. The Bible reads like this. And then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. How many times? Daily. Daily. And follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will what? Lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will what? Save it. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, right now I come before you, God, and I just pray that in this moment that you soften hearts today. God, I pray, Lord, that we can get deep and personal. God, that we start to do some personal examining in our hearts, God, in our lives. As we get ready to understand what it means to sacrifice, as we understand what it means to follow you, as we address this altar of convenience that often we do to make things fit into our plans instead of fitting into your plans, I pray that we address those today. God, I pray that we are convicted but I pray that we are encouraged. I pray we walk out of here just a little bit differently. In your name we pray, and we all say together, amen. You guys can go ahead and take your seats. Take your seats. So uh, I want you guys to leave here encouraged, but I also want you to know, and I say this all the time, anytime I come up here to preach a message, and, and by the way, I'm just honored to be able to be here with you all, and I appreciate my parents and my pastor for allowing me and giving me the honor to do this and trusting me. By the way, they are, they are in Hawaii right now for their 33-year anniversary. Can we just make sure they can hear us in the chat because they are watching? So let's just make some noise for them in this place. 33 years uh, of marriage, so they are in Hawaii, and they are having a great time. So continue to pray for them while they are out there. But um, going back to just me being up here, one thing that I've been challenged from the very beginning is I don't want to come up here and just give you my opinion, because that is not what preaching the word is about. I never want to just come up here and tell you this is what I think. So I I allow God to do a work in me, and then I feel like, hey, this is something that I need to share. So today, what I'm going to be preaching on is based on my own convictions that I believe will also be your convictions. And as we really look at this verse, and it says here, whoever wants to be my disciple, Jesus is saying, whoever wants to follow me, whoever wants to be my student, whoever wants to imitate me, that you need to deny yourself and pick up your cross when? Daily. Daily. Not once a week. Not when all of a sudden you need a favor from God. Not all of a sudden when that, that you're, you're going for that job interview and now you're saying, hey God, if, if you just set everything up how I need it to be, I will surely pick up that cross and follow you. Not only when storms hit, not only when times get tough, not only when you're facing some real difficult situations, because if we're honest, can we go there? Most of the times, we're in close relationships with our pastors when we need something. Think about how much time you have personally spent, not just with God, but with your pastors. Excuse me, I got something in my mouth. Not just with God, but with your pastors, but it's been because you needed something. Because you needed encouragement, and you needed prayer, and then all of a sudden now that everything is good, guess what? You don't need them anymore. And it's not just about man, but it's how we are with God. We go to God when times are tough, or we need something from him. And listen, it's going to happen. I guarantee you, not 365 days of the year, me included, are we waking up or going to sleep, and every single day reading our word and connecting with God. That's just the reality. Let's not sugarcoat this. It should be that way, 
But it's not that way. It's a daily decision. It's a daily decision to be inconvenienced. Because how many of us know that it is inconvenient to wake up early to put time aside for God? Let's be honest. Who here loves to sleep? Raise your hand. Whoever's not raising their hand, you're lying in church, right? Uh, We all love to sleep. Some of us wish we could be sleeping right now. Some of you love sleep so much that you wake up late on purpose on Sundays because you don't have to be here till 10, 15. Can we go there? You ain't going to like me today. Because it's inconveniencing me because I work the whole week. And I got kids, and I got things going on, so it's easier for me not to set my alarm early, but to set it a little bit later so I can sleep, and I'm, I'll at least catch some of the worship. Ooh, we're going there today. Hey, listen, listen. If you feel I'm talking about you, guess what? I probably am. Now, again, I'm not saying that you're, you're sinning by deciding to wake up late and you're sinning by doing these things, but they are an inclination and they are a view of what's really going on and where your priorities are. And it leads to a bigger issue. The Bible says that we need to deny ourselves. Not deny him, not den- deny ourselves. So what's convenient to us, we need to deny that. Pick up our cross daily and pursue them. If you're here today, I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to answer this out loud, but I want to ask you this. Do you truly want to be a disciple of Jesus? Think about that. Looking at this verse, choosing to pick up my cross daily, choosing to deny myself, choosing to lose my life here so that I can save it in eternity. Understand that that means I'm going to be in uncomfortable situations. Understand that I may be looked at differently. Understanding that means I may not be invited to certain things that my coworkers are doing. Understanding that means I need to change the way I live. Understanding I need to remove some things from my life that are putting priority over God. Understanding I need to remove the things in my life that I do that put me under an influence that put God's to the side. Are you truly willing to give all of that up to be a disciple for Christ? Answer that truthfully to yourself. And if the answer is no, my prayer today, maybe that answer is no because you feel that that's too much. Maybe that answer is no because you just feel you're not ready. Maybe that answer is no because you're a young person here and you're just coming because your parents make you come. Maybe your answer is no because you're here because of your spouse and you're just watching this. Then my prayer is that God will continue to soften your heart and start doing some things in you and start putting the right people in your life to show you that he cares for you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. Talk about inconvenience. We serve a God who inconvenienced himself for you, who sent his son on the cross for who? For you. And it's a big deal to wake up on time for church. Can we go there? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not coming up here and say you wake up late, you're going to hell. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there are some things that we need to say. Let's correct the easy things, Bernie. Let's correct the easy things because there's a bigger war going on that the devil is trying to attack you in. Can we correct the easy things? Do you truly want to be a disciple for Christ? Now, maybe you're here and you answered that question. No. Then I ask you, do you truly understand what that means? Because sometimes we think of Christianity as one thing, accepting God, and then discipleship as the next level. When in reality, Christianity and discipleship are one and the same because a disciple means to follow Christ. To be a Christian by definition means a follower of Christ. There is no, okay, I'm giving my life to God and then I'm going to wait to the right moment to then start giving everything up to follow him. No, as soon as you decide, hey, I'm making that commitment to be a Christian, I'm making that decision to be a disciple of Christ. So are you truly a disciple? Are you truly a Christian? Or are you just that by the title because of association? Do you consider yourself a Christian because you come to Culture City Church? Do you consider yourself a Christian because you've done the membership? Do you consider yourself a Christian because you've done all the right things, because you give your tithe, because you give up your time, because you serve on this team? Maybe you don't serve, but maybe you come every week and you try your hardest. Does that make you a Christian? It's when we truly decide to follow Christ in everything or some things that we do. Everything. Everything that we do. 
This, here's the sad reality. The sad reality today is that we have people who are fitting in church based on how convenient it is for their lifestyle. We have people in our generation today who decide whether or not they are going to attend the church based on how convenient it is for their schedule. We have people who will fight and fit in church based on how convenient it is for their schedule today because they have a party to go to. So they're going to miss church that day because I have a, to prepare for this party again. I'm not saying it's sinful, but where is your priority at? Because I don't know about you if you, if you know this, but the bot, coming to church is biblical. Right from the very beginning in the book of Acts, it says that they were in community. Everyone had a need and that God added to the number what? Daily. He added to the number daily because the body of the Christ was coming together. Look at what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10. It says, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Listen, church is necessary on your spiritual journey. Church, coming to church and being in community is necessary part, is a necessary part of your spiritual journey. But guess what? Not just showing up to church, but being in community is a part of your necessary steps in your journey. Can we stop making church so drama filled? I understand it. Listen, let's just set the stage. We are not perfect. I may say things that offend you. I am sorry, but guess who else I offend? My wife. That doesn't mean that she leaves me. We are family when we come together. Let's talk about it. Let's get through this because God wants to do some things and he's using one another to help us get there. Live stream. If you are using live stream because it is convenient for you, you are meant to be in community. Live stream is a great tool, but we have so many people who use it because it is convenient, and now they don't have to deal with people because I don't feel welcome there, I don't feel welcomed here, and all of a sudden now we start to believe these lies of the enemy that people don't love me, I'm not welcome here, people don't like me here, and we start to believe these things. Church is important, but do we make church about what is convenient for me? Do I make church about what is convenient for my lifestyle? Because I'm not going to sit here and say you're going to hell, but there is sin that is creeping at your door. And any entrance that he can find and he can slip through, he will do it. What is stopping you? What is stopping you from taking that next step and getting into church? What is stopping people you want to know what my conviction is? So those of us who've been around in this ministry for years, you understand my thought process and where we're going. Listen, I'm not saying that I want Culture City to be a church that is burning people out, that is demanding a lot of people, but can I be real? We used to have church services four times a week, and we used to be packed. People's hearts were different. We had church service once a week. How many times? Once a week. And it is hard for you to get here talk about convenience. Can we be real? Making a daily choice to deny myself, to deny my personal desires. Listen, I get it. I'm not speaking to anybody and everybody because I understand situations are different. I'm not talking about just the person who doesn't come in here. Man, you got to rethink yourself. Because I get it that situations happen. I get that circumstances happen. I'm talking about what you deal with in here. What's your reasonings? Are they reasons or are they excuses from the things that you don't want to deal with because it's inconvenient? Can we take it a step further? Yes. Is serving in church inconvenient for you? Is it inconvenient to come in a little bit early because you're serving in a particular ministry. He wants to talk about inconvenience. My worship team and our production team, they get her at 745. That's me. That's very inconvenient for me because I want to sleep. But I don't 
choose to do that based on what's convenient for me. I choose it because I know that God has called me and given me gifts and he's called me to reach people and he's called me to love people. So understand, I don't do it for the church. I don't do it for the pastor. I don't do it because, hey, this has to get done. I do it because God has given me gifts and abilities so that I can use it here. Are you not serving in church today because it is inconvenient for you? Because it doesn't line up with your schedule? Because you got kids. Hey, I got kids. And I can make it happen. Now, again, this is not comparing, but I'm telling you, this is somebody who understands, who understands you. Listen, this is the reality. We find ourselves allowing to make small decisions based on what inconvenience us. Imagine when you start getting to the real stuff, to the real pain, to the real issues. If you can't make small decisions or you can't inconvenience yourself in something small, how are you going to inconvenience yourself in something big? It's the reality, church. Deny myself. That's what this is about. Not my circumstance, because circumstances affect things. I get that. But deny myself. Put my inconvenience to the side. Yes, it may be a little bit harder. Maybe there's some adjustments that I need to make in my life. But God, if this is helping me step a little bit closer to my calling, then that's where I want to be. Can I be honest with you? A lot of you here, convenience is killing your calling. God has so much more for you in the next five years that you are delaying your process because serving in ministry to stand in front of a door and say hi to people is inconvenient for you. Because coming to church is inconvenient for you. And you say, man, God has nothing for me. God, where are you at? Convenience is killing your calling. See, a lot of times, you know what we want in life? We want the goods but we don't want everything that it takes to get there. How many meat eaters in the house today? Steak lovers, that's right. Throw that steak up there real quick. Ooh, who's hungry? Who, who are my, who my chefs in the house though? Who can throw down on a good steak? We got a couple chefs right here. Only a few of you. Okay, so I'm gonna go over your house pretty soon, okay? Make me a steak. How many of us want this, would love to eat this steak? If you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry, I should have put a plate of vegetables for you. So just just cover the meat, right? But it's the same thing. Same thing, okay? That looks good. That looks delicious. But to make that means I got to invest some time in really figuring that out. I got to sometimes look up a recipe. For some of us who can make that real good, it took us some time to get there. We failed a couple times. We tried a couple times. We finally get that. Or... Maybe we just go to the restaurant and we got to pay a lot of money to get a good steak, right? You know what's convenient if you don't have time to make that? You know what's convenient if you don't have the money to use that? Let me see that. Here you go, right here. Convenience. Convenience. I want that. I want the juicy stuff. But I don't want to take the time to have to learn how to cook. I don't want to try and fail. I don't want to go out and get all the ingredients because I look and I don't have everything that I need. So instead, I settle for convenience. Just because something is convenient and is easy doesn't mean it's always right. I wonder how many of us, my relationship with God is a frozen TV dinner meal. God, I want more of you. God, I want you to bless my life. God, I want you to bless my family. But I need it done right away, so here you go. Just because convenience is easy doesn't mean it's always better. Just because convenience is easy and it will get you what you need. This takes eight and a half minutes. Eight and a half minutes. I'm going to give this away for free by the end if you remember all the points, by the way, right? What a good, what a good winner. Eight and a half minutes. Convenience. Convenience. We want that, but we settle for this because it's convenience. How many of us, our purpose, our calling is being murdered by convenience? One of the things that I admire about my parents is the willingness that they had to answer the call. Bernie, you could take this. Everybody's getting hungry as they see this. (laughs) 
One of the things that I admire the most about my parents is their ability or their wanting to answer the call. You've heard my, my father share this story, but I'll share it from my perspective. Um, I remember in, I think it was the year 2000, um, or yeah, it was the year 2000, we were getting sent out to Cleveland, Ohio to go start a church. Now you heard my father say this story, but now that I'm a man and I work, it's like, it blows my mind, right? Uh, he started in a factory, working in a factory, worked his way up, was obedient to God throughout all of that. One thing I, lo- I can sit here and say that both my father and my mother were constantly involved in church. Let me tell you, parents, this is I am a product of what I saw and what I seen. So don't get upset when all of a sudden your kids grow up and they're acting in certain ways or they're not responding in ways you want to and you didn't give them the best example. But I seen this. I seen them serving in the church. But one thing that they always did a great job in is they always included me and my brothers throughout the process. It was never about, hey, we have church and you guys just come along for the ride. It was always a family thing. So he goes from working a factory job. We would, again, have four services. Sunday, what was it, 8 a.m.? I think service was 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. Then we would go home, and then they would yell at us because we had a second service, and they wanted to take a nap. And me and my brothers, we weren't trying to nap. We were trying to to play. So they would go home, they would take a nap, and then they would go to a 7.30 p.m. Sunday service. And then they would go to work on Monday. And then after work, my dad would get home about 6, 6.30 and have to get ready because he had a Bible study he had to run at 7.30. And then we used to do outreaches at 7.30 on Tuesdays. And then on Wednesdays, we would do another service at 7.30. I think Thursdays we had a break. And then Friday, we did another service. And then Saturday was outreach. Now listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying we need to go back to the way things were because I will sit here and tell you, I believe that we can't always do things like we used to because my opinion on all you old school folks, all that word old school means to me is resistance to change. So I'm okay with old school mentalities. I'm against old school ways because I think we need to adapt and I think we need to change. However, what worked for them worked for them. And now what works for us here will work for us in this time. But I constantly seen them being inconvenienced. So my father goes and he then gets a job as a director in a clinic from a factory to uh, offered a position to be a director. And then he gets the call and says, hey, we want to send you to Cleveland, Ohio. It was a desire that he had for many years. But God was already preparing him through the different things for him to get that. I believe some of you here have a desire to be a pastor, but there are some things that God is stepping you into before you get there. And sometimes we get so irritated with what the current situation is that you don't even see the bigger picture on what God is trying to do. So then he accepts the call. He goes from getting an offer to be a director in a clinic. Guess where he goes back to work? In a factory taking me and my brothers with him. I didn't want to go. I was 10 years old at the time. I cried about it. I didn't want to go. I had to go to a new school. I'm sure they felt that. I'm sure, I mean, now that I have kids, I wouldn't want to just pull them and make them do their whole new life. They, they felt this. You talk about inconvenience. You talk about inconvenience where now finally doing something with your, your career to now having to go back to where you all started. But that didn't matter to them because what matters is the calling that got put in their life because obedience is different from, from oh, I'm sorry, obedience is inconvenient in our lives. When you obey God, that will be inconvenient for you. But for them, it was answering the call regardless of how inconvenient it was going to be for them because they knew that God called them for something bigger and for something greater. And some of you here, your next step is just to start showing up to church and you're killing your calling. For some of you, the next step is just to start serving in ministry and you're killing your calling because there are some things that God needs to prepare in you before he gets you here and you're stopping it. Why? Because it's inconvenient for you. Don't get upset when you're overlooked. Don't get upset when all of a sudden other things start happening and blessings start happening in other people's lives and you're sitting there and you're saying, what's about me? Genesis chapter four. I want you to turn there. I want to look at a very familiar portion of the text of two brothers, Cain and Abel, who both did the right thing but one did it the wrong way. Because I got news for you. Those of you who serve on the team, don't just sit there like, yeah, see, I'm all good. I serve on the team. Because you can do the right thing the wrong way. We can have a team of 
50, 75 people who are here because the pastor asked them to, because they feel that's a requirement, or because they feel convicted because they need to do it and their heart's not in the right place. You can give your tithes every single week, two weeks, whenever you give it, and do it with the wrong heart. So here we see two examples of Cain and Abel, and we know who they are. These are the sons of Adam and Eve. You talk about them being raised in the ways of God, right? Cain, Adam and Eve got to see God in a whole different way than any of us ever will. These people walked with him. Adam had the ability to name things like, talk about a tight relationship. I can only imagine, and you better believe that God had to start, that Adam and Eve really raised their kids in knowing that anytime you come to God, you give him your what? Your best. Even if it's inconvenient to you, you give them your best. So we have a feeling that, I'm assuming at least, that Adam and Eve had to have expressed this to them. So we see here, in verse 2, it says, now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked in the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. How many of us want to be looked at with favor by God? But Cain, everybody say, but Cain. And his offering... He did not look with favor. So Cain was angry and his face was downcast. So here we see Cain and Abel, who, again, we assume were really taught the right way. By the way, parents, can I just encourage you for a second? Just because you teach your kids the right way doesn't mean that they will always go that way. It is not your fault. But you keep teaching that. You keep doing that. You don't let up. If my parents would have given up on me, some of you know my story, if they would have given up on me, I wouldn't be here right now, in this building, on this stage, but because they fought for me, because what I thought was unfair, they seen something bigger. They saw an, uh, a, a battle that I couldn't see, and they were fighting for me. So here's Cain and Abel doing the same thing. Can you imagine how, how Adam and Eve felt to know that their son murdered their other? Imagine how much of a failure they must have felt. Imagine what they were going through. Parents, you are not a failure. Because there comes a certain point where they need to answer for themselves. So here's Abel. He listens. He takes that. He gives his best, even if it inconveniences him. He takes the fattish portion. How many steak lovers in the house? How many of us know that the fat is where all the juice is, right? The ribeye, right? That's where all the good stuff is. So Abel says, hey, I'm going to give him the good stuff. And then on top of that, he takes it from the firstborn of his flock. And he says, I'm not going to see what I have and compare. I'm going to give him right here the best of the best. Who else gave their firstborn as a sacrifice? God. So we see Abel giving this example. And here's the thing. God has been teaching us to give our best from the very beginning from Abel and then he asked Moses to do what to sacrifice his son Isaac and then he does it himself and he sends his one and only son to be a sacrifice for you he has been teaching you to give your best from the very beginning so now here's Cain and Cain comes up and now the Bible doesn't really tell us why Cain's offering was bad. Now, we can assume and we can speculate, right, that he probably didn't give him his best. He probably gave him what was, what was the left or whatever. But one thing we do know, for God to look down on his offering because Cain came with the, right, with the wrong heart. Cain came to God and God said, uh-uh, I don't accept that. I know that you can do better. So Cain gets upset. Let's keep reading. The Bible tells us here, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? How many of us know that God will check you? What's going on? Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Yo, what are you tripping for? I'm talking to you in the church online. What are you tripping for? If you only do what's right, don't you get it? Then you will be accepted and things will start working in your favor. But the problem is sometimes to do right doesn't feel so good. But you know what does? To do wrong. 
Wrong is convenience. Doing things, breaking the rules, following rules, laws, that's hard. That's inconvenient because it goes against what we want and what we desire. But doing the wrong thing feels good. So he tells them, he says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God sees things that we can't see. He's saying, Cain, listen, do what is right because right at your door, at your footsteps is sin that is waiting to creep in. And if you don't correct some of these things here that you are doing, it is only a matter of time before it enters into your heart and takes over. You need to rule over that. Don't let it rule over you. So again, I'm preaching to you. I'm not saying that because you don't come to church, you're going to hell. Because you don't serve in ministry, you're going to hell. But I'm telling you that sin is creeping at your hearts and there are things that God is putting in your path, serving in a ministry so that you can do what you were called to do, so you can start pursuing your calling, getting connected to a church, getting off of live stream when you're fully capable of coming into the building. There are these things that God wants to do because he sees sin is creeping at your door. Maybe you're here and you're part of the team and you're serving, but you don't have the right heart. You're doing all the right things, but the wrong way sin is creeping at your door. And what does Cain do? He gets upset. Just like maybe some of you here today. Who does he think he is up there? Saying that he's so wrong. I need to serve in ministry. He just, they just want people to work in the church. Saying that we need to be in church every day. It doesn't mean I'm going to hell. Are you getting upset with me here today? Or are you allowing God to start telling you and teaching you some things? That hey listen, whatever it is in your heart that you're dealing with, get it right. Because if you want the more that God has for you, it takes you taking the steps. It takes you stepping into the more, not just expecting God to throw it at your footsteps. Listen to me. Inconvenience will always interfere with your convictions. When you give in to convenience, all of a sudden now what convicted you didn't matter because it feels good in the moment. Because we start to tune out the voice of the Holy Spirit. And we start to give into things. Listen to me. I am not saying that any of this here is unto man. I am not preaching this message and saying you need to commit to your, submit to your pastor. I am not sitting here and saying you need to submit to Culture City Church or to whatever church that you may be attending if you're watching this. What I'm saying is this is all about submitting unto God. That's what this is about. Submitting unto God. Serving in church doesn't mean that you should be burnt out. Serving and doing things for God doesn't mean that you should neglect your family. Serving and doing more for God doesn't mean that you need to now start, you need to quit your job. What it means is you need to be open to what God wants to do in your life. See, sometimes another thing that we do when it comes to convenience, that if something doesn't feel convenient to us in the moment, then it must not be from God. So you sit here and say, oh, I must not be a pastor because I'm not good at speaking in front of big crowds. Doesn't feel right. Doesn't feel natural. Oh, I'm not good with kids, so I can never be a part of a youth ministry, or I can never be part of a a kid's ministry. Oh, I'm not good with talking with people, so I must be called to do something behind the scenes. Listen, God isn't calling you to what feels natural. God is in the business of using people with stuttering problems. Hello, Moses. God is in the business of using people who are led by fear. What's up, Gideon? God is in the business of using people who are overlooked by their own father and left in the fields. What's going on, David? That is the business that God is using. So if you are here waiting today for you to feel this comfort and say, oh, this is what God has called me to do this whole time, then you are waiting for convenience to line up when the God that I know will put you in the most inconvenient situations and then it'll feel natural once you step in. If you would have asked me seven, eight years ago if I'd be up here today, I would say no way. 
Some people say, oh, man, you're such a great speaker. You don't see all the insecurities I have in my head. I, I feel like I slur my words. I talk over myself. I remember I did a meeting for one of my companies. They sent me out to, to a training, and I had to present it. And I don't know, maybe some of you relate. All of a sudden, my, my breathing started to get real short, and my hands started shaking. I'm just like, what's going on with me? And I would have never told you that I'd be able to speak in front of people. But how many of us can say, but God? Because it's not about me, but it's about what God wants to do. See, some of you are afraid to step into the more, but God. Somebody say, but God. Because it's not about you. The Bible says that he gives us strength because through him we can do all things. Don't let your convenience stop you from doing something and don't let your inconvenience be an excuse to step into the calling that God has for you. And start in the now with the little steps. I believe that Culture City can send out campuses and I believe that there may be people here today who will be leading some of those campuses, who will be leading different ministries, who will be doing certain things. But before God can get you there, there are some small steps that he needs you to take. And the enemy loves for you to feel inconvenienced. You know, the only one who should be inconvenienced by you coming to church is the devil. The only one who should be inconvenienced by you doing more for God is the devil. Are you inconveniencing yourself and allowing him to win? Or are you going to step out and say, you know what, God? I'm ready to take that next step. I'm ready to put myself to the side. I'm ready to deny my desires, pick up my cross in the little things so that you can prepare me for the big things. With that, I want every head bowed and every eye closed all over this place. Every head bowed and every eye closed. As you're here today and you listen to this message, Every single person in here, I want you to respond this way. I want you to respond as if Jesus was coming back in the next five minutes. I want you to respond that in the next five minutes, you are going to be face to face right there wondering, where am I going? Am I, am I entering in through these golden gates or, or these pearly gates or am I going to be banished? This is serious, church, me included. And listen, I had to come to some real realizations with God in preparing this. And in my own time, had to, had to respond that way and say, God, let me look at my life. Because if you were to come right now in this moment, could I sit there and stand in front of you and say, God, I did everything that I could to deny myself and put you first because we need to examine every single part of our life right now. What in your life have you been holding back on that the enemy is trying to keep you from stepping into greater? Respond as if in the next five minutes, that is all you had. And you're here today. And you say, you know what? God, I, I'm not, my life doesn't fully look like it should. My heart is not in the right place. I've been doing the right things, but I've been doing it with the wrong heart. Maybe you're here and you have no idea who Jesus is. Maybe you answered that question no earlier. Maybe you don't have a personal relationship with God. If you were to see him in the next five minutes, that's how I want you to respond. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't care if you are serving in ministry. I don't care if you are a part of this worship team. I don't care who you are. Every head bowed, every eye closed, because this is serious. If, if this were to happen right here, right now, on the count of three, if you're here today and you say, I just need to get my heart right with God, I want you to raise your hand and put it down. One, two, three, go. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Honesty. This, is, this has nothing to do with what people are going to think, but all to do with God. What, what can I do to surrender? And that's what raising our hands is, an act of surrenderance. You're here today and say, God, I, I need to start aligning some things in my life and in my heart. If you raise your hand or maybe you didn't, but you still want to repeat this prayer because you want to take this moment to just release and to give it all to God, I want you to repeat after me and say, Jesus, I come to you as a sinner asking that you forgive me of my sins. 
I have been putting things in front of you. I have allowed other things to take priority in my life. But right now, I want to change that. I want to pursue you. Because I believe that you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins, for me. And that you raised him from the dead so that he can now live in my heart and walk with me every step of the way. I confess you as my Lord and Savior over every area of my life. And I pray that you put the right people in my path to help me go down this journey. In your precious name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, maybe you're here today. Every head still bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today. You're a Christian. You're a disciple. You're a follower of Christ. But God is tugging at your heart today. There are some things that he wants to deal with. We are in a series called Altar. The altar is a place of sacrifice. When I open up these altars, I encourage you to come up here and leave whatever it is that you have been holding on to. Leave whatever it is that has been stopping you. Leave whatever it is that has been holding you back. If you're watching online, right where you are, you drop to your knees and you make this sacrifice unto God and say, God, from now on, I give you this. Whatever it is that has been holding me back, whatever it is that has been stopping me to pursue you right now these altars are open at this very moment I, I encourage you to come up here use this as an altar of sacrifice and say God this is not about the person next to me this is not about the person behind me but this is all about me I leave it here at the altar to sacrifice it to you as we sing this song come on I want to know you for who you really are Hallelujah. We want to know you, Jesus. Hallelujah, my God. Oh, I want to have your way, Jesus, my God. For who you really are. Yes, my God. I want to know. Yes, I want to know. Oh, I wanna know you. 
Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. We really hope that this message encouraged you today. Now, if you're watching this and you need prayer, or maybe you're interested in starting a relationship with Jesus, but you just don't know where to begin, then do us a favor and text prayer to 708-336-5053. We want to connect with you, pray with you, encourage you, and just do life with you. Now, at any time, if this message encouraged you, then we want you to share this with somebody. Share this with a coworker or a family member or even a friend. And then don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you know every time we go live, we wouldn't want to do church without you. And lastly, if our ministry has impacted you in any way, we want to ask that you consider partnering with us so that we can continue to reach more people. You can do that by visiting us at culturecitychurch.org or visiting the link in the description. I want you to know that we love you, that we're praying for you. So let's go out this week and change the culture.